Now, uh, another Christmas tradition that it starts on Boxing Day for hockey fans, of course, is the World Juniors. And uh, to talk the World Juniors, we brought in our uh, our junior analyst. Well, this guy knows everything about pretty much uh, every prospect out there from Daily Faceoff. Stephen Ellis uh, joins us, who who did put in the uh, chat before we came on air that he's missing the Canadian beef. So he, he knows Alberta beef is where it's at, Steve. I used to live in Calgary, so I, I know how good it could be. But uh, it's not the same here in Ontario. No, it isn't. I know it. it people don't understand why. It just isn't. It's I've had steak in Ontario, and I'm like, come on, this is like a it's like a C cut compared to the A or A plus that we'll get. Uh, what about triple A Alberta beef? Oh, hundred percent, by A plus, unreal. And by the way, Black Angus is a little bit better. Just saying, uh, Stevie. The uh, the World Juniors gets going tomorrow on uh, Boxing Day, and uh, Sweden. A lot, you know, they're hosting this year. Lots of people are are pretty high on the Swedes. Where do you come out on them? It's hard to trust the Swedes. You you kind of see them at all these international tournaments year after year, where they look like one of the favorites, and then they just completely fall apart. I think with this team, even without Leo Carlson, they've got the good offensive depth. They got the good, def- uh, good defensive options. I'm a little worried about their goaltending, but I think you know this is as good of a Swedish group that we've seen in recent years. And I kind of hope that we that they can impress those fans at home. But I don't know. A lot of people are having them gold or silver. I'm I just I'm not buying it yet. So I was in Sweden for the Global Series, Stephen, and I'm not kidding you. They literally had a coaches summit where they talked about how broken their development system is because they haven't won. And I find that to be kind of ridiculous. First off, they had that incredible streak. Is it still going in the preliminary round? No, broke, I think, 2020 or 2021. 58 game, something crazy, some crazy number. They won 50 plus games in a row Yeah, in the, in the round Robin part. And they haven't broken through, but I'm, I'm looking at it saying, look at all their great players that end up in the NHL every year. The third largest nation in terms of developing NHL players. Nothing's broken, is it? See, they care a lot about their international results. Obviously, they want to send players to the NHL, but you look at their their men's team. They haven't won gold since 2018. They haven't won silver since 2011. Like they don't. It's It's been kind of difficult on that front. And then you look at, the junior teams, obviously, the last time they won the World Juniors was like 2012, and it's been very difficult for them. The under-18 team has started to show some promise, and I think that's why so many people are talking about this group, where the last two years they have made it to the finals of the under-18s. They won it two years ago, and they they lost just last year to the United States. Um, so they keep developing players. Like That's not a problem. I think still, if we put a best on best, Sweden would still be pretty competitive, but they care a lot about these international tournaments, and they're not coming home with the success they probably should be. And I'm guessing it hurts even more because their biggest rival always finds a way to show up and get in the medals. Finland is the team at the world juniors. That's like, they're always in it and they're the best bronze medal country going by far. Yeah. It's funny. There was a time where the Finns, it was like at this tournament specifically, it was either they won gold or they would come in eighth or come in ninth. (laughs) It was kind of just never, there was a one year when it was in Canada and they were playing Latvia in the, in the uh, relegation round. Like that was crazy considering I'm pretty sure they won the year before that. So the Finns, it's hit or miss, but the one thing they do so well is they're, they're structured no matter what tournament they're playing in. They don't need to have a star player. Like this year, their best player is Consta Hellenius and he's not drafted yet. He's 2024 draft prospect. But with this fin- finished group, it's just like they commit to defense. They commit to hardworking players. They, they kind of are just like a bunch of four flying grinders fighting out for every single shift they they're on. And it works out like, Let's not forget the 2019 World Championship. They had zero NHL players on their team. Kevin Lankinen was the goalie at the time. He was kind of an unknown quantity. And they went out there and beat Canada in the gold medal game. And it's because just no matter what tournament they're playing and they just they get together, they work hard. And with this Finnish group, they've been playing together at different tournaments. So they come into these things pretty prepared, especially on the home ice. I don't have them doing super well this year, but that's typical. When I, when I doubt them is when they go out there and win gold and shock everybody. So. Canada, Finland, and U.S. have won the last 12 tournaments. Canada 5, or 11, excuse me. Canada 5, U.S. and uh, Sweet, uh, Finland have each won three. Um, you know, Canada and the U.S. Canada, this is the first time they went back-to-back since like 2008, 2009. But uh, the U.S. coming in anyway, Steve, most people have the U.S. as 
as the favorite and, and, you know, they got one of their best players or captain now is healthy and cleared for the tournament. Uh, give me your assessment of team USA. Easily the favorite to win this whole thing. And I wrote about yes. this week in the preview. It's if you're an American, you're going to like this um, going back to the U 18s, you know, they did win the U 18s last year. And a lot of those players, Will Smith, Gabe Perot, uh, Ryan Leonard, they're going to be there. They've got some unbelievable goaltending and Trey Augustine and Jacob Fowler. Like those two would be the starting goalie on any other team in this tournament. And they're going to share the net here. That's pretty cool. Uh, and this, the pure talent at every position, the defense is considered probably their weak point, maybe even a weak point compared to Canada. And it's got Lane Hudson on there. It's got Seamus Casey and they're two of the best college defensemen. Zeev Bouillon, I think a lot of people are going to really see how good of a prospect he is. He's a 2024 NHL draft prospect. But then we're looking at Cutter Goche. Again, Will Smith, Ryan Leonard, Rucker McGordy. The, the scoring options are so good to the point where they did need to bring Cole Eisenman, one of the top pro players for 2024. They didn't have to bring the top prospect for 2025 and James Haggins. Quinton Musty's dominating. And I do want to share just one quick story. I did mention it before, but... Um, with, with Sam Hillebrand, the third goalie for USA. I just think it's such a cool story that last year he was playing junior C hockey and he got brought on to Barry as an emergency backup one night. Now he's the third goalie of the USA World Junior Team. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's a crazy story to go from junior C to the World Juniors in one year's period of time, not even. Hmm. Um, you mentioned uh, for the US, no Cole Iserman. And for me... He's been the guy that's I'm always looking at the world juniors through a draft lens. Like, yes, it's, it's impressive to see which guys that have already been picked, take a step forward. But with so much eyes on Macklin Celebrini for Canada, the fact that Iserman isn't here, what is, what do you take from that? What does it mean anything in terms of his draft stock? Will it hurt him? I, I felt he was a long shot to make the team regardless. And I don't think it'll, it'll hurt, uh, Curtis draft talks, uh, talking to some scouts uh, at the USA camp. A lot didn't expect him to be there just because his game is built around scoring goals. And clearly he's able to do that this year. But there's a lot of guys who could do that on this team. That's why Quinton Musty wasn't invited to camp either, despite him putting up like a 110 point pace in the OHL. When it comes to, to um, Iserman, it's, uh, he wasn't going to play a third line role for this team. He wasn't going to play a fourth line role. There were guys who did, you know, the defensive side of the game a bit better. Uh, my thought, maybe if he did make it, it'd be the 13th forward. But then even then, I would have argued that James Haggins would have fit that role a bit better. So I don't think it hurts his ranking too much. This is just one little sample size. I guess it does. It's, it's worth noting he has been hurt for a little bit too. Um, so who knows if he would have been able to go regardless. I would have loved to see him at camp. It's not like it was far for him to go. It's the same arena that he plays in. Um, but I think with him, it's just, it. If his game is not an all-around dominant display yet. And I think that's something he's going to work on in college. Uh, so I, in my pre-tournament roster projections, I never had him making the team. So it doesn't surprise me, but I wish he was there just to see how good he could have done, uh, maybe in a power play role type thing. So Cole Eiserman, as mentioned, uh, was number two on your board in your preseason rankings. Um, he has 27 goals in 23 games uh, with the U.S. under 18 team, which is a crazy number. Um, so let me take this a step further then and tell me if this is a, a bridge too far. Does the fact that Eiserman doesn't make the U.S. team and Macklin Celebrini is expected to play a huge role on Team Canada's team. They're both draft eligible players, both the same age, may go one and two in the draft this year. The fact that Celebrini is being asked to play such a significant, potentially pivotal role for Canada, and Iserman is even on the U.S. team, does it speak to the level of disparity between the two programs at all, or am I am I too, am I a bridge too far? No, I wouldn't say that. I think just Celebrini is just such a unique player. Like you look at him and, you know, talking to some scouts and coaches that will compare him to Sidney Crosby and, mm -hmm. and Jonathan Tays from a stylistic perspective. No one's expecting him to become a top five player in the NHL right away. But I think the way he plays such a strong two way game, the way he just commits to everything, he's got the skill. He he's throwing a lot more hits than I remember watching him uh, in the USHL. He's just kind of a special beast where, you know, if you're also just looking from a, you know, a talent perspective, Canada's missing a lot of its best players here. Zach Benson's not there. Um, obviously, Connor Bedard, Adam Fantilli, like Celebrini would not have played such a big role if Canada was at full strength. While the Americans, you're looking at them and 
yeah, the, the the scoring depth is is great, but they I feel like the Americans have a bit more you know guys who are just strong defensively where they've got those that really stacked top six, but then you look at the bottom six and there's more about the speed and the the own zone defensive play. While Canada is a bit more about trying to use the skill, so I think it's kind of also a coaching difference and how they like to look at the two teams, but. I don't think Celebrini would be playing this big of a role if he was playing one more year in the USHL. If he, I think the fact that he's been playing college already and has been able to play against older competition, and the only other guy on this Canadian team that's been able to do that is Matthew Wood, kind of just shows to just how quality of a player Celebrini is more than the difference between the two programs, I'd say. So I hate throwing out the term generational. I hate, hate, hate. It's so overused. We, we need to have a clear delineation for me in terms of when a player gets that tag. You know, too often people were building up different dr number one draft picks over the years, whether it was Alexi Lafreniere or whoever it might be, attaching tags and titles to them that they didn't deserve. It was last year at this tournament that Connor Bedard actually kind of broke through. And we had this discussion with Craig Button on the same pod where he said, you know what, I had to change my mind and had to make him a generational talent because he had done something at this tournament at this level that really no one had done since Wayne Gretzky is how far away is Celebrini from that tag or is he, is he close to it already? Like what he's done this year has been incredibly impressive. You know what? I, I don't want to use the word generational because I, I want to compare him closer to Adam Fantilli. I think those are, that's a good comparison as a guy that comes into college in their draft year and just dominates. Fantilli was a year older, had an extra year junior than Celebrini, which is why what Celebrini's doing is incredible. Um, I We had the generational player last year. We can't have another generational player. The well, you after. can. You yeah. had McDavid and Matthews back-to-back -back years. Sure. Like, yeah, sure. It I, happens. I don't know. I'm... I still put McDavid in his own category. Um, well, he is, and he yeah. probably will be forever. I, yeah. In terms what about of Cros what about Crosby and Ovi? Okay. Yeah. No. I, that, that's a good point. I, I, I still I'm thinking he's closer to Fantilli than he is to um, Bedard. To Bedard, and I don't think we're calling Fantilli a generational player. I think Celebrini is going to be a top ten player in the NHL when he's at his full strength, but I don't think he's. I I, I can't call him a generational right now. Like I, I'd almost look at this tournament and. 10 points would be a huge, great moment for him. We can't compare him to well, obviously what Connor Bedard did last year because no one's going to do that again. And well, now, but course, just to be clear, yeah, this yeah. exact time last year, we yeah. were not saying Bedard generational. I was personally. I, everyone, at least that I had, was talking to in the scouting community, they were like, great player, unbelievable, stone cold number one pick, not generational. I was at the time I was looking at him and Michkov in the same, like these guys are going to be game changing in the NHL to a level we haven't seen since McDavid. I personally was on the Bedard train very early, but the world juniors really cemented that he was more than just going to be a superstar. I think. Yeah. Well, I'm probably in the minority. I, I'm like generational. I agree. I think generational gets over you sometimes. And, I'm going to have to see more from Bedard before I think guys got to show like five years in the NHL. Then we can start talking about them as generational players. That's just me. But if there is one guy who's not in the tournament, Steve, that I want to talk about because Frank was talking about Iserman and he's had an unreal year, 27 goals so far this season. Well, there, there's a kid in, in medicine hat. I saw him live for the, and literally his first two shifts. I was like, I, I thought he was, geez, well, who drafted this guy? He's huge. Six foot three, 215 pounds. He skates. He hits. He's got an unreal shot. Caden Lindstrom for the Medicine Hat Tigers. Now, I didn't make Team Canada, but I want this this kid, Steve. In the two games that I've watched him, he blew my mind. Just you don't see guys that big, that strong. He's got a he's like a power forward. He's got a little edge to his game. What do you make of Lindstrom, and how high do you think by the end? Because I I see him on your latest board. I think you had him seventh. How high do you think he goes? Talking to some scouts at the Candace Camp, thought he can go number three. Like that's the thing about this. I think this year's draft, it's clear who the number one is, but then you look at second to maybe eighth or ninth, it's a lot closer than I think a lot of people expected it to be. Because I thought a lot of people maybe would have, it would have been a, Ivan Demidov and Cole Eisenman would have stole the show. Demidov dealt with an injury, and I think that hurt him, him in some ways uh, because there are some points that I've seen him recently where he's not as engaged as he used to be. But with Lindstrom, like, I know a lot, of, it was like, at first, a late first-round pick, 
maybe, but then he really showed a lot more than just being a big guy out there. With yes. WHL players, they have a much more unique development curve because they typically get an extra year or at least a good chunk of that extra year um, playing in the WHL compared to the other CHL guys who have to wait. But with Lindstrom, he shows he's a lot more than just someone who can just knock people over. Yeah, he plays physical. He's on pace for like 150 penalty minutes this year, but he's also on pace for about 100 points. Um, I would have loved to see him get a chance to see if this Canada team, because the way yeah. he works, that work ethic would have, I think he would have forced himself onto the team in some way over someone like Owen Allard or Carson Raykopf. But with just the way that Lidstrom just physically dominates, the best way to compare him, and I, I know you guys probably didn't watch a lot of Quinton Byfield or the York Simcoe Express, but watching him go out there and just crush everybody and then score. Like one time I saw Byfield throw a hit on a one-on-one, -on -one, knocked the guy down, and then went and still scored a really nice goal. That's what you see with Lindstrom. He's just built on power. And a guy like that's going to have a good career. Uh, and, and his skating's really good for his size, too. You see these bigger guys, and they can't skate, and then they're they're kind of limited in a way. But we're not. that's not an issue here. So I had him at seven in my last draft board. I, I haven't fully finalized my next one, but he is going to be higher than number seven. You know, it's it's funny. When I was watching that game, we were sitting in the crowd with my my U11 hockey team. And then we walked up to uh, to get some food. And sitting at the top of my section was Jerome Aginla because he was in town for uh, his coaches, his, uh, his son's hockey team. So I, I know Iggy, so I went over and we chatted. And I right away, I saw, you know, who you noticed in, you know, Lidstrom right away. Or, and I was just like, he's like a young Jerome. And he goes, I was never that big or that fast. Like, you know, now obviously I'm not saying it could be Jerome, but he, uh, it was, it was interesting that he was there because I don't, you know, he's got a little bit of an edge to his game that Jerome had, like Jerome would, was not afraid to drop the gloves every now and then you just don't see that anymore from a lot of players. And I think that's an added element that is so hard to find in hockey players. It's almost like if Yuri Slavkovsky was like, if, if, he could take what makes Lindstrom so dominant. He would be a significantly better NHL player. It's just, he knows how to use his size to his advantage. He's willing to drop the gloves. He's got the energy. He's chirping at players. And then he backs it up with goals. It's like a guy like that's going to be a fan favorite. So you, um, I haven't had a chance to see him in person yet, but just from watching those games, it's, you see something special there. You, you mentioned Jerome McGinley. His son is a first round pick this year and off to a great start. Where's he going to end up on your board? Oh, yeah, I, I'm thinking, you know, f some people have them pretty high. I know some are looking at 14, 15. I, I got him at 16 on my most recent board. I think he's kind of a mid first round guy. Uh, he's got the smarts. Uh, he knows how to score. You know, last year watching him in Seattle, it looked like he was miscast and didn't play a lot. Uh, was basically nowhere to be found in the playoffs type thing. And uh, watching him this year just looks like a guy who really had to prove to himself that he could be a first round pick because there were high expectations. You look at his name and you look at the pedigree of that family. And uh, I think he had to really prove to himself what he could do. And last year was not a really good showing of that. This year, it's a different story. Everything seems to be going in. He's got a great shot. Kelowna is a lot of fun to watch. They got Andrew Kristall too. And we know, the offense he was able to contribute last year and this year. But with Aginla, I think, you know, he's a mid first rounder um, who, if he keeps scoring at this rate, I wouldn't be surprised if a team picks him up a little earlier uh, just because I think the ceiling's pretty high there. But I I'm, I'm comfortable at 15, 16 right now. 25 goals in 32 games. Pretty Dude. decent start with the Kelowna Rockets. Hey, the, the WHL this year, Steve, has, uh, I think they have five of the top six goal scorers of draft eligible players who have 20 goals so far, right? Lidstrom. And you mentioned again, Paris Jack out of Prince George, um, uh, Berkeley cat out of the Spokane chiefs. And I think Tanner Howe's up to 20 goals too. So I haven't seen that in a long time out of the dub. No, which is funny. Cause you look at last year and that was the year where all the, the WHL kids were coming from. And of course, you know, looking at all this and there's still Gavin McKenna coming through and all the hype for him in, in 2026. But yeah, the WHL is a good league to watch this year. Like Riley height, uh, obviously drafted by Minnesota last year and somehow didn't make the world junior team. And he's having a good time, but Prince George, I remember those days when Prince George oh. was a terrible team to watch and I would do TV hits there. And it's like, are we making the playoffs next year? We're we making the playoffs next year. And it was just like, <laughs> eventually it was going to pay off and it did. And you see all those guys that are, are, are scoring there and, and Parish Jack's one of those who you know, 26 goals this year, over 50 points already, you know, not on anyone's radar heading into the season. Now he's looking like a first round pick. Some people point out and say, Oh, he's playing with some great quality players. Like, of course he's going to produce, but he's driving a lot of that play and kind of like Gabe pro last year, goals are goals. 
those aren't easy to come by. If you're scoring them, people notice. So uh, the WHL has been the league to watch this year, once again, in the, in, in the NHL draft compared to, you know, the OHL and QMJHL the last couple of years. It's, it's been a strong year. So let's, let's get back to world junior um, team Canada. You mentioned the Americans clear favorites. How good is this team Canada team? I, I still think it's a very good team and a lot better than people are giving them credit for, you know, obviously going out there and getting Matthew Patra helps uh, out of Boston. Celebrini is as good as he is. I feel like people just forget Matt Savoy exists a lot of the time because he's a dominant junior player. Uh, <laughs> defensively, Denton Matejchuk's having a great year. Uh, I would not want to is a stud. He is, yeah. I do not want to have to go one on one with uh, um, Maverick Lamoureux, six foot six, six foot seven, just an absolute beast, and he makes it clear he's huge. Uh, Noah Warren's also big at six foot five. The big question for me is who the goalie is going to be. Mathis Rousseau, I think, is the one with a bit of the favorite. Uh, Coach Allen with Tang really liked him in camp, but he's small, five eleven, undrafted. You know the odds are against him, but we saw last year what happened to Thomas Mill, a small undrafted goalie that stole the show and. You know, small goalies don't typically do that well in the NHL. World juniors are a different story because most of these guys are still playing junior hockey and it's that's okay. So I think with with this Canadian team, they've got enough depth, enough skill, and a lot of hardworking guys, guys like Easton Cowan and and players like that will just continue to grind you out. They're gonna be a difficult team to play against. They're just not my pick for medal because they don't have the pure talent the United States does. About the Czech uh the Czechia. Czechs, uh, Steve, and Czechia, and you know, like they won back to back years, but it's 20 years ago, right? And they really haven't been, you know, overly competitive since. Well, what's kind of gone wrong there? And do you see any light at the end of the tunnel? Good question. I think the Czechs would love to know what has gone wrong over their, their time period of, of like they basically have not competed for a medal outside of last year since I've watched this tournament. So uh, it's it's been a while. But there are better days coming forward. I think this year, they're no longer a sleeper underdog option. I think you got to keep them in that crowd with Canada, USA, Sweden, Finland. Uh, we saw what they did last year and obviously came very close to winning gold. And they even beat Canada in that first game. And they've got one of the best players in the tournament, in Yuri Kulik, the Buffalo Sabres prospect. Just another dominant season in the AHL. I, I, I feel vindicated that he's been so good because he was someone that I said like is going to be the biggest deal of the draft when he got taken where he was because uh, just putting up great numbers with the national team and always seemed to produce when I watched him. It's like he, he scores, he puts pucks in the net. It works. And he showed that in the last two world juniors where he's been the most important player. So this year, that's good. They don't have a ton of high end talent outside of that, but they do have a big goalie in, in Michael Rabel, six foot six, who is having a decent year in the, as an NCAA rookie, 18 years old, going to be the goalie next year. My one concern is we've seen him at the Halenka, we've seen him at the U18s just fall apart when medals are on the line and when things start to really matter. So we'll see what happens here. But the Czechs are just, they're another team kind of like the Finns that have more adopted this grinding mentality of like, okay, well, we don't have the skill of Canada. We don't have the skill of USA. We got to find ways to win. And last year it was just rolling four lines of full energy. And, and we're going to see that again this year. So uh, I, I, they're definitely in the medal conversation. I wouldn't be surprised if they snuck in and got third. Don't think they're going to get gold this year, but last year was the, that was the, my underdog pick to win it all, and they came pretty close. The Columbus Blue Jackets have been an absolute shit show this year. We've <laughs> talked about it. Um, David Yurichek, I think, is already their second best um, defenseman right now. His brother uh, Adam, how is he in your top ten somewhere? And and how good could he be? And and an impact guy for the Czechs. He is in my top 10. I had him 10th in my last rankings. And um, yeah, it's it, he's coming off an injury. So we'll have to see kind of how healthy he is um, at this point. Uh, but watching him play this year, you know, you look at the stats and you're not seeing a whole lot. He's got one point all year long, but he's such a smart player. And Helenka Gretzky really showed that where he's play, he was playing heavy minutes, playing 25, 26 minutes a night and was blocking shots, playing power play, power, playing penalty kill. And then from a stylistic standpoint, there's actually a lot of similarities between him and his brother. I did like David a bit more at the same age. I thought David was just a step above everybody, but He's got some size. He's got some reach. There's a lot of power in his shot. I feel like the fact that he hasn't produced at all in the Czech League this year is not a sign of any issues. It's more of, you know, it's tough for a young guy like that to be getting a lot of opportunities and he's not always playing against the best competition uh, or with his, the best, comp uh, best players on his own team. But 
I, I, your checks to me it might be a, I think it's a lock to be a top four defenseman in the NHL when he gets, uh, makes it over. I wouldn't be shocked if he follows kind of a similar career path, go to the AHL next year and just see what he could do there. But I, I'm very high on him of all the top quality defensemen in this draft. There's one that consistently stays consistent uh, in all the viewings. And that's your check. Steve um, for fun. Who's winning? USA USA is winning gold. And uh, every time I pick them, they tend to lose. But uh, this year I just, they really need to screw things up to fall apart here this year. They just, they're deep. Is, awesome. Uh, quick question is, is Mons goose? Is he a net for Sweden? <laughs> no, did he make the team? Uh, no, he is not. He did not make this team. He's an intriguing guy at six, five. Another guy that's on, on the radar. He is. Yes. The Swedes have some pretty good goaltenders coming up and that seems to be a good factory, but it's kind of weird where this year their goalie is probably Hugo Havlid at five eleven, a small goalie, but he's the coach's son and he typically oh. plays pretty well for Sweden. So that helps. <laughs> So Steve, give me, uh, give us your, give us your metal ranking, your, your metal table. What is it? I'm going USA for gold. I think Canada is going to win their group, which will give them a slightly better chance of making the finals. I'm giving them second going Sweden in third. Well, I'm picking, I'm, I'm going to go bold and say Slovakia comes fourth. I think the Slovaks are the underdog team to watch this year. Ooh. Nice. U.S. Canada final. Just take it and hook it right into my veins. Yes, at 11 a.m. Eastern, I'm pretty sure. So not exactly the most ideal time for us. To but it'll be on a Friday, game, though. Hey, why not? And it's a Friday. It's you, and and look, Stephen Ellis, as as everyone just witnessed on on our chat today, no one on the planet watches more hockey than you. And I, I say that, and I truly believe it. I think scouts that are at 300 NHL, 300, not NHL games, but 300 games a year do not see as much hockey as you. I'm going to two games tonight alone. So it's, I guess that works. Guy I'm going to watch three games machine. this afternoon. <laughs> Take some time off, sir. No such thing. All right, buddy. Have a good one. Yes, you too. As uh, Stephen Ellis joining us from uh, Daily Face Off. Yeah, his, his write ups on the players, um, you know, obviously just sitting and chatting with Steve. And, uh, you know, you see, he knows all the players. He watches so much and he, 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 and he'll watch like division three and other leagues. Just looking yeah, for you're like, dude, guy. what, like, what are you doing? But you know what? It. It's good for him. He knows lots of different players, but uh, I'm telling you, Frank, you watch out for, uh, um, it, it's been a while. Like, obviously I'd say people say it's been a while, but Bedard obviously was elite, but that Lidstrom kid, we haven't seen a power forward like that in a long time. 